This specimen is in the collections of the uh, Natural History Museum at the University of Oslo, and this is one of their prime specimens. It's one of their most famous specimens that they have. I work with the curator, the vertebrate paleontologist at the University of Oslo, who's in charge of this specimen. And what's really exceptional about this is that only a small number of, of these casts really exists. Each one of them takes many, many hours to make, both after the cast is poured, there is something like 30 or so hours of detailed painting work that's done to very, very closely replicate what the actual specimen looks like. So it's a very, very high quality reproduction. And only two museums in the United States have a copy of this um, as well, one being the Smithsonian, the other being the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. So um, now there's one in Fairbanks. And so you say this is similar to what the specimen itself looks like then. Did, would you, were you able to see the specimen? Uh, yes, I've seen the exact specimen. In fact, a new exhibit specifically built around this one individual find was just opened at the Natural History Museum in Oslo when I was there. And there are um, at least two books now that have been published based around this one specimen, one, one documentary, and three peer-reviewed scientific articles, which are all around the controversy about the relationships of this primate within all primate evolution. So it's a pretty hot topic of, of discussion in invertebrate paleontology. This specimen opens up all of those stories for you in your classroom and at the museum here. In the world, we have these exceptional fossil sites. We give them this actually German name. We call them Lagerstätten. And so Messel is a site in Germany with incredibly high quality preservation, including evidence for all the soft tissues that an animal had on it, including skin and fur and feathers and things like this. And that's one of the exceptional things about this fossil is that the body outline and all the fur is very, very clearly preserved as an outline and a sort of a carbon stain on the, on the edge of the skeleton. So we know what the body shape was like. You know, it's exquisitely preserved. It has absolutely every single bone in the body. What was really exciting about this is that this is a very early primate, you know, a member of the group of mammals to which we belong. So this particular specimen suddenly became thrust into the spotlight as potentially, if you will, one of our earlier ancestors, not a direct ancestor, but a, an early member of a group from which possibly the human lineage of primates evolved. That's highly contentious. That's the kind of the interesting thing about it. Some people say that this fossil is more closely related to a group of primates that did not lead to humans, but another group says, no, no, this is a very early group of primate uh, on the lineage that led to humans and chimpanzees and orangutans and things like that, which are our closest relatives. Is there any reason to not want to have this here because of that controversy, or would you rather address it and talk about it and have that be a part of your teaching tools? Well, that's the best thing about it is that it is controversial. We don't know everything in science. It's just a way of knowing and understanding. It doesn't provide answers. And this particular specimen just makes us refine our thinking about what we thought we knew, and it'll help create controversy, which is a good thing because that focuses interest in research in, in a particular area. And usually, after a lot of hyperbole and yelling and screaming and debates, the dust will settle and and people will say, oh, okay, I guess, yeah, it's either a, a this or a that. Either way, it's an exceptional specimen in that it, it brings our way of thinking up to the forefront. And because it has potentially something to do with primate evolution and ultimately human evolution, of course, it gets a, a greater proportional amount of attention. But to my mind, it's just a very cool little primate, whatever it is. And what, does this specimen have a name itself? Is there a specific name for it? This specimen is widely known as Ida, or Ida, is that the way they say it in Europe. Ida is the name of my colleague's daughter. And one of the reasons for that is this is not an adult. This is a juvenile. In fact, it died less than a year of age. And we can tell that based on its teeth. And we can see the tooth replacement going on in the teeth. So we know it's a, it's a young animal. We also know that it had an injured wrist. So it's got kind of a, an extra bone growth on its wrist. And perhaps that had something to do ultimately with its death. Do you know how it was formed? Do you know that story? Yeah, so the animal probably drowned in a, in a shallow lake that had basically no oxygen at the bottom of the lake. Take a muskrat or a beaver and throw it into a pond, there's enough oxygen at the bottom of the pond that it'll totally decay away, including the bones. So this is an animal that lived after the extinction of the dinosaurs by you know almost a good 20 million years. 
And what are you going to do with it? It's right now it's in your office. Do you have plans for it in the museum? We will use this specimen for teaching. I teach a vertebrate paleontology course and definitely be used in that. Um, and this is definitely a, a major addition to the teaching collection, but it also, I, I hope, will be used for exhibit at some point in the museum as well. We don't have a specific thing in, in mind for it at the moment, um, but considering we also have a very active mammalogy department in the museum, um, there's no reason why we might not be able to join forces and have this on display at some point.